Hey guys, what's going on? Um, I wanted to make a video about all of these available drugs we have right now for um, treating ulcerative colitis. There have been a lot of questions and requests to do a video like this and I really do want to do a video like this because making the decision to start drug therapy is really hard because you have to research what types of drugs there are and like the doses and like the costs associated with them all. Of course your doctors are there to help you make these kinds of decisions but it is really important for you to be part of making these types of decisions and um, it's really hard because there is no standard treatment for ulcerative colitis and um, everyone's different so um, just a disclaimer I think if you don't understand what ulcerative colitis is and um, you haven't seen my video on what is ulcerative colitis, I think you should watch that. It would make it a lot easier for you to follow along and understand the concepts of this video. So I will link it down below, so take a look at that if you haven't. So yeah, I'm going to give you a rundown on all of the available treatments we have for ulcerative colitis today and all of the risks associated with them um, and everything you might want to know before taking them. There are a lot of drugs, so this video might be long, so I'm going to put a couple links in the description um, of times of each drug that I'm going to talk about in case you were looking to just know about a specific drug. So starting with the benefits of taking medication is that it reduces complications, it reduces the frequency of flares, it minimizes your hospital visits, it improves healing, um, you enjoy longer periods of remission, and just you get an overall, overall better quality of life. So the most commonly used medications are um, steroids, the 5 ASAs, and biologics. The so 5 ASAs, the main goal of 5 ASA therapy is to help you achieve and maintain remission for patients who have mild to moderate colitis. Um, these drugs can be taken orally or as a suppository or enema. If you have UC closer to the lower part of the colon or in your rectum, it might be more effective to apply the 5-ASA directly to the inflammation. Risk of infection is very low, um, but it can occur. Symptoms of infection may include fever, redness, swelling, tenderness, and heat at the site of infection. Risk of developing intolerance or an allergic reaction is also very low, but can occur after the first dose or over time. Um, symptoms include hive, rash, swelling, or fever. There is no risk of cancer. Okay, I'm going to butcher all of the names of these medications, but I'm going to try. The first type of 5 ASA is a sulfasalazine, and those are um, salazopurin and azulfidine. <laughs> so these types of drugs are made of two parts. They're made of the 5 ASA and the sulfa antibiotic. Um, the sulfa part is released in your smaller intestine and then the 5 ASA can only be released by an enzyme produced in your colon. And this ensures that the inflammation in the colon is treated rather than the small intestine where it passes through. However, side effects appear to be due to the sulfa part of the drug being released in the small intestine. Um, these include upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, um, some rare side effects include skin rashes, fever, decreased blood cell counts, and infertility in men. The next 5 ASA is a delayed release mesalamine, which are acicol, pentasa, salofalc, mesavant, and leuda. I suck at this. <laughs> Okay, to prevent the side effects that that previous drug caused, um, these drugs have been designed so the 5-ASA compound stays intact until it reaches the colon. So the acicol, salfoc, mesavalent, and lalidia drugs are coated with a waxy film 
that dissolves and releases the 5-ASA when the acid in the colon has been neutralized. Um, in Pentaza, the 5-ASA is present in hundreds of tiny granules that escape slowly over time. And when taking these drugs, you can experience side effects, but they're usually mild, like um, headaches or rare allergic reactions. Um, the downside to these kinds of drugs are the convenience factor, and some of these doses are typically taken between two and four times a day. The next type of drug is a balsasalzide. Bal sal bal 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 <laughs> Colazide. Similar to the sulfasaline, this drug is made of two parts and it separates when it reaches the colon, releasing the 5-ASA. And side effects are similar to those of the 5-ASA containing compounds like headaches and rare allergic reactions. And the last drug type is an alsalazine, a dipentum. It's composed of two 5-ASA molecules that split apart when working in the colon. But for some people, the two 5-ASA molecules bound together can irritate the lining of the small intestine, um, resulting in diarrhea. Other side effects are similar to those of the 5-ASA containing compounds, headaches, and rare allergic reactions. So the next type of drug is a steroid, and not to be confused with the performance enhancing steroids. Um, these steroids have quite the opposite effect if taken long enough. You can actually lose muscle bulk and strength. These steroids are a short-term therapy to rapidly reduce inflammation by suppressing the activity of white blood cells. This is not a maintenance therapy. Your doctor has to have an exit strategy, which means there will need to be a follow-up drug to the steroids to help keep you in remission. Depending on the severity and location of your colitis, um, steroids can be taken intravenously, orally, or rectally. Risk of infection is pretty high when you're on steroids. Symptoms of infection may include fever, redness, swelling, tenderness, and heat at the site of infection. There is a risk of slowly developing osteoporosis, which is the loss of bone density when taking steroids for a long period of time. There is no risk of cancer and once your symptoms improve, your doctor will carefully and gradually wean you off the steroid. Do not stop taking the steroids on your own. So the most commonly prescribed oral steroid is prednisone because it's cheap and very effective. If you're in a pretty serious flare, your doctor will prescribe you a relatively high dose between 40 and 60 milligrams taken once per day, and this dose is gradually tapered off over a period of two to four months. So when I was prescribed prednisone, I was on 40 milligrams, tapering off five milligrams every other week. The side effects that I have experienced when I was on prednisone include moon face, acne, weight gain, fluid retention, increased appetite, insomnia, easy bruising, and poor wound healing, um, mood swings, and increased energy. Some uncommon and possibly irreversible side effects include blood pressure, diabetes, cataracts, osteoporosis, and avascular necrosis of hip joints. Increase in appetite and weight gain can actually be a good thing for people with UC if you manage it properly. So when I was in my first flare, I had no appetite and I lost 25 pounds. Um, but after a few weeks of taking prednisone, I was always hungry um, and I started gaining back my weight slowly. Most of the weight I gained back was actually due to fatty tissues rather than muscle or lean body mass, but I kept a frequent workout schedule and a healthy diet and now I'm at my ideal size and weight. Um, all my fat has actually turned into muscle and I'm actually a lot more happy with my body now than I was even before I was diagnosed. The next steroid is methylprednisolone or solumedrol, and it's a steroid given intravenously. Um, this is what I was actually on when I was in the hospital before they switched me over to prednisone one week before I was being released. The side effects are all the same as prednisone, um, but you may experience some muscle cramps, back pain, a metallic taste in your mouth, or an allergic reaction. Hydrocortisone, prednisolone, and betamethasone all have the same benefits and side effects as prednisone, but can be administered 
intravenously, orally, or rectally as a foam. Uh, these drugs are absorbed into the bloodstream and circulate throughout your whole body. Betasonide or entocort is formulated with a delayed release coating and targets the first part of the colon. Um, it's made to target specific areas and be absorbed less into the bloodstream and has fewer side effects and less toxicity. It's also available in some countries as a rectal foam. Immunosuppressants, um, drugs that suppress the immune system, so they reduce the inflammation and prevent the body from mistakenly attacking its own digestive system. It can take several months for immunosuppressants to reach their full effects, so um, they are often combined with steroids or biologics at the time. You have to be careful taking these drugs because they do increase the risk of certain types of infections. Imurin and 6MP are two drugs that work the same way. They are given in pill form and taken once a day. I'm currently on Imurin. They are very slow acting medications and can typically take up to three months to take effect, so they are not useful in treating flares. It's a long term treatment strategy, typically four to five years of staying on these drugs before a doctor can suggest stopping the therapy. These drugs are useful for keeping people in remission and reducing the need for steroids. It's very common to use this in combination with Remicade, one of the newer biologic drugs. It's found to be very effective in treating both um, Crohn's and colitis. The only main side effect that I've noticed from taking Imuran is like tingling in my arms and legs sometimes, um, but other than that I haven't had any major side effects. It's important to have frequent monitoring with blood tests to check your vitamin levels and detect any signs of abnormal liver, as well as bone marrow tests. Uh, methotrexate was originally used to treat certain types of cancers. It interferes with the production of DNA, which means less production of immune cells, which makes it an immu immunosuppressant. It's usually taken once a week by mouth or by injection under the skin into a muscle. Just like Imuran and 6MP, it's used to keep people in remission and is often given in combination with Remicade. It's also known to reduce the antibodies that form against Remicade, which isn't a great thing because it can increase the possibility of side effects, which will decrease Remicade's effectiveness. This is why Imuran and 6MP are generally the first choice to be used in combination with Remicade. Side effects are rare, but some people experience nausea or vomiting on the day of the week that methotrexate is given. Um, these side effects can be reduced by taking it before bed and by taking anti-nausea medication. There is risk of liver da of liver, da liver damage. Liver damage. There is risk of liver damage, and it's increased by moderate to heavy alcohol consumption. So it's important to limit your drinking and take frequent blood tests. Cyclosporine is usually given as an IV at first and then switched over to an oral form when the patient starts to improve. Uh, the patient is usually on neural for three to six months and then switched to Imuran. Biologics and biosimilars. Um, these are a newer type of medication for people with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. Used to control inflammation and maintain remission for a long term. Biologics can be delivered through IV or through self-injection. Biologics are proteins that are derived from living organisms. They target a specific pathway in the immune system and they block it so there's no overproduction of white blood cells which cause the inflammation. It's important to know that blocking too many white blood cells can lessen your body's ability to fight infections. So you have to be more careful about getting sick. So like wash your hands more often and visit the doctor more frequently. Risk of infection, intolerance, reaction, and cancer are very low with biologics. Other risks include bruising and bleeding easily, difficult breathing or shortness of breath, tingling, numbness in arms and legs, vision problems, yellow of, yellowing of skin, or whites of eyes, um, dark brown urine, fever that does not go away, swelling of ankles and feet, sudden unexplained weight gain, and chest pain. It's important to make sure you do not receive a live vaccine while taking the biologics. These are vaccines like the measles vaccine, seasonal flu, seasonal flu nasal spray, um, chicken pox or smallpox vaccines, etc. You can still receive killed virus vaccines, which are shots like the flu shot, rabies vaccine, hep A vaccine, those kind of things. 
The first biologic is Remicade, yay! Remicade is an antibody produced using genetic technology composed part of human protein and part mouse protein. More specifically, it blocks the overproduction of TNF-alpha proteins. So too much TNF-alpha is what causes the inflammation and damage in the colon. Because Remicade is a protein, it can't be taken orally because it will be broken down and made ineffective by the digestive enzymes in your stomach and in your small intestines. So it has to be given by IV over a period of two or three hours in an infusion clinic. Most doctors give the standard three dose induction regimen. Starting on your first infusion, your next infusion will be given two weeks after that, and then your next infusion will be given six weeks after your first infusion. Following your third infusion, your doctor will assess your progress and prescribe infusions for every six to eight weeks. It takes up to several weeks before you can start seeing improvement with Remicade. The response to Remicade is very impressive, and sometimes people may think they're cured, but once it's stopped, they almost always go back into a flare. So it's very important to keep taking your medication. It is also possible to develop antibodies to Remicade, which might make you have to switch to another treatment. Humira is currently the only completely human TNF alpha blocker. Um, Humira is still seen by the immune system as being foreign, so it still does develop antibodies, but not as many antibodies as um, they form against Remicade. And Humira is given as a self-injection every one to two weeks. Simza or Kimza was also developed to block the TNF alpha proteins, but it's different because it's not a complete antibody, it's only a fragment of an antibody which is attached to a large particle called a PEG or a PEG in order to slow down its elimination from the body. It's given as a self-injection similar to Humira, initially three times over the first four weeks and then every four weeks after that. Symponi is very similar to Humira and Simza, but fewer injections. So one injection every four weeks instead of every two weeks like Humira. Intibio is one of the newest types of biologics. This was developed for people who have tried other TNF alpha blockers, but it didn't work for them or they developed antibodies against it. Intivio specifically binds to the alpha-4 beta-7 protein which blocks the pathway of the white blood cells that are being directed into the colon. It's administered through IV over a period of approximately 30 minutes. Same as Remicade, it's administered at weeks 1, 2, and 6 for the three, first three doses and then every 68 weeks after that. And same with the others, it takes up to several weeks before you can start seeing improvement. And the last one is a biosimilar to the Remicade. It's called Infliximab DYYB, or Inflectra. So the purpose of the DYYB at the end is to distinguish the difference between the biosimilar and the original product, which is Remicade. It isn't a copy of Remicade. It's just a similar product made by a different company with a different process. So there are no clinically meaningful differences between them. It works the same way as Remicade, but it doesn't do the same thing. Biologics are a large molecule and biosimilars are a smaller molecule. It's difficult to explain the differences between them in detail, but a simple analogy I found is that it's harder to say that two wines are sufficiently interchangeable because of the differences in the yeast strain, weather, grape harvest, or soil than it is to say that two soda pops are sufficiently interchangeable because they contain the same flavoring, powder, and salts. The advantage of taking this biosimilar is that it's much less expensive than Remicade. Obviously, if you are diagnosed with a very mild case of colitis and have a small chance of developing any complications, you'd want to start on a medication that has the least side effects. Um, however, these might be less potent or less consistent in treating the inflammation. If these drugs don't work, you should take a step up and consider a more potent drug. However, these may be associated with a higher chance of side effects. You should keep taking steps up until you find a treatment that works for you. This might be one drug on its own or it might be a combination of drugs. Approximately 30 to 40 percent of people with UC are diagnosed with pancolitis and 40 to 50 percent of those patients will require a colectomy within the first five years of disease. 
Um, these patients usually require steroids and hospitalization and would benefit from top-down therapy. So what about FMT? This is a fecal microbiota transplant. A lot of people have been asking me about this as an option for therapy. It's actually a type of transplant where the stool is being transplanted from a healthy person into a person with colitis. And it's done in two ways, either through the nasal gastric tube that goes through your nose and into your small intestine, and then the stool is pumped through that, or it's done through colonoscopy or enema. Right now in Canada, the only condition where FMT has been approved is for C. difficile infections that are recurrent and can't be treated with antibiotics. But for IBD, it's not approved and it's still experimental and studies are still going on to look at the benefits. Currently, studies are conflicting and some studies are showing that there are benefits to it and some are showing no benefits at all. So right now it's only available in an experimental fashion. So you have a lot to think about. Are you someone who might respond really well to a certain medication but might not be willing to take the risk of certain side effects? Or are you someone who might accept the side effects in order to find the most effective treatment for you? These are things that you should be talking to your doctor and your family about. Anytime you get a new prescription, make sure you ask your doctor what kind of effects it might have on your ulcerative colitis and if it has any interaction with any of the drugs that you're already taking for your UC. Okay, my camera died at the end, which means that this took way too long, but it's totally worth it because I know this is going to help somebody. I just want to thank the CDHF again for providing all this awesome information, and I want to give a shout out to my GI for always educating me and encouraging me to live a normal lifestyle. And please subscribe if you haven't yet, and I will see you guys soon. Bye!